Lord be with you. I'd like to welcome everyone here today, both in the sanctuary and those who are watching from their homes. This is the Lord's Day, and we will be glad in it. I'd also this morning like to welcome Jimmy Cathcart. He's listed as James Cathcart, but he likes to go by Jimmy. So we are glad to have you here and that you're sharing your musical gifts with us this morning in the glory of God. And now let's breathe in deeply. Breathe in the very breath of God. Let us worship God. Please join me in the call to worship. A love that never ceases, a creativity that designed the universe, a hope that cannot be quenched, a pursuit of reconciliation no matter the cost. These are the things that are of God. Then let us worship God. A voice is crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins. You call us to set the captives free and seek justice for the oppressed, but we live in fear of our neighbors and hide ourselves from our own kin. Forgive us, God of grace, Set us free from sin, death and fear, so that we may serve you with gladness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are God's children, called to be different, called to act differently, and called to live as new people. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, 
Let us forgive one another and pass the peace of Christ to each other. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. The first lesson comes from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. Listen now for the word of God. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them well. He asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any questions. While Jesus was teaching in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at the right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how can he be his son? And the large crowd was listening to him and him with delight. He taught, as he taught, he said, beware of the scribes who link, who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped in Adim, but there was no water for the people to drink. We remain appreciative and grateful for all of the pastors and congregations of the Synod across Illinois and Missouri and Kansas, you proclaiming God's word week in and week out during this difficult time. It is a privilege to stand alongside you in offering this word today. So hear now this word from the book of Exodus, chapter 17. Listen for God's word. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? It was a Sunday morning in 1956. The next day, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. would go on trial in Montgomery, Alabama for his role in the bus boycott there and the protests that followed. But on this morning, he was preaching in Louisville, Kentucky, at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. And he was talking about the University of Alabama, where after the school was compelled to admit its first black student, riots had broken out and police ultimately restored order only by asking the student to leave for her own safety. King described a conversation about how much unrest had been caused since the bus boycott had begun, a conversation where a man told him how much more difficult race relations were now because of the tension, how peace had been destroyed in the community. And in his sermon, King said this, I agree that it is more tension now, but peace is not merely the absence of this tension, but the presence of justice. And even if we didn't have this tension, we still wouldn't have positive peace. King said, we can accept exploitation and injustice and there would be peace. But it would be a peace boiled down to stagnant complacency, deadening a passivity. And if peace means this, I don't want peace. I've been preaching for 21 years, which means there's a good chance that when a passage comes up in the lectionary, especially one of the greats like this one, Water from the Rock, I've probably preached on it before. To be honest, I rarely reuse an old sermon. Maybe I'm just not imaginative enough, but it never seems like the right word for 1999 or 2002 is quite the right word for today. But at some point in my planning process, I do usually go back and see what I said before. I mean, I've still got the same books on my shelves, right? And frankly, my shallow knowledge of Hebrew uh, and Greek was even less shallow back then when I was just a few years out of seminary. Of course, because I have often preached on lectionary texts, certain texts come up at the same time of year. And so I stumbled across the sermon I preached on this text 12 years ago this week. That was the last time I preached on it. I was just back to the church I served as pastor from my first and only sabbatical. I'd had three months away to study and write and rest. It's my first week back in the pulpit. It was also just six weeks before a national election. And the mood of the country and of the congregation, it is safe to say, was not restful or serene. Campaign ads filled the airwaves, debates were in the headlines, the most important election of a generation was a line I quoted in the sermon. Twelve years ago, we were enduring a financial crisis with a massive bailout being considered by Congress. 
There had been a handful of deaths and serious illnesses in the congregation I served. Maybe it all sounds a little familiar. I mean, on a certain level, 2008 actually sounds like sort of a golden age of peace and harmony compared to now, positively idenic, but it didn't feel that way at the time. And the questions of that day still resound. Do we have a future or are we falling apart? Can we endure any more conflict, any more struggle, any more suffering? Will we have an identity a few years from now? Or will what we have held dear be taken from us? There are questions I'd offer that are not so different from the ones raised by the people of Israel in the 17th chapter of Exodus. One question in particular, one asked through the ages using different words and uttered in different tones of voice, but which keeps coming down again and again to a few simple words. Is God among us or not? Is God among us or not? The Israelites may not have had a presidential election going on, but they certainly did have debates, a serious heated debate, in fact, really a two-part debate. The first round was between p the people and Moses. The people are thirsty, and they ask for water. And Moses answers back, asking them why they're testing the Lord, but the people have a rebuttal for that, and it goes something like this. Who said anything about the Lord? We were talking to you. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Why are you killing us and our children and our livestock? There is considerable and dangerous unrest. Moses fears for his life. And so begins round two of the debate with a new participant introduced. This one is between Moses and God. It's a short conversation, really. Moses says to God, what shall I do with this people? And you can imagine his tone of voice. He's really saying, what are you going to do about your people, God? This is your fault. But you know, God doesn't debate, really. God acts. I think it would be easy to judge the Israelites the way Moses was judging them, easy to point at their ingratitude for the miracle of their deliverance through the Red Sea just a few chapters before, easy to wonder where their memory had gone. Maybe it's because they've tasted the good bread, because they've sipped the wine of freedom, that the elusive water of sustenance now seems so valuable, that the desert seems so God-forsaken. Maybe. And yet, there's no denying they really do need water. They were thirsty. And not just mowed the lawn thirsty, but no plumbing, no streams, no rivers, no rain, no hope. Thirsty. I suppose to imagine their plight, we have to hear their question as though it were being asked today by someone else. Perhaps it might be spoken by the 815 million people who go to bed hungry every night and woke up hungry this morning. Maybe it is asked by the grieving families of the 200,000 Americans and many hundreds of thousands more worldwide who have died of COVID-19. We might hear the voice of that thirst in those long silenced in our churches, whether they be LGBTQ people who still struggle to find equal opportunities to serve, or people of color who are welcome to the table but not always listened to, or those who are disregarded for their age, too young or too old. It could be the thirst of parents crying out in the streets, mourning the death of their son or daughter, unarmed and killed by a police officer. It could be the thirst of a young protester blinded by a tear gas canister. The thirst of an idealist who fears their vote or their voice will be taken away from them. In fact, maybe we don't even have to imagine who's speaking these questions. Maybe we've even done the asking of these questions ourselves. People are dying. Is God among us? People are afraid. Is God among us or not? It's not a question that's really resolved through debate. 
No set of arguments answers it. No vote decides it. No persuasion gives us comfort. No words suffice. And so the word of the Lord comes, as it often comes in turbulent times, with unsettled understanding, not as words, but as an act, an elegant sign, the desperately needed water delivered, not from a stream or from a rain cloud, but gushing forth from a stone. The whole of scripture is this. God does not condemn the people's protests. God does not condemn Moses, even for confronting God directly. God hears, and God acts. On that sabbatical, one of the places I had the opportunity to spend a few weeks was Rome, a place where water actually still pours forth from stone. See, what I didn't know before that trip was that most of those famous fountains are fed not by modern plumbing, but by ancient aqueducts, sometimes aqueducts from before Christ, which flow from springs in the Italian countryside across miles and miles, only to pop up in the center of the city, issuing perfectly pure, drinkable water right out of the stone statues that have been built on top of the fountainheads. Literally, water from the rock. And still today, they drink of that water there. It's a sign of life. It is the sustainer of life. We know this about water. Each time we baptize a child of God, we proclaim that she or he or they, like each of us when we entered this community, was included in God's miraculous provision that like each ancient Hebrew freed from slavery and delivered to the promised land, each one is a child of God. And in our promises at baptism, we commit ourselves anew to building that promised land of goodness and equity and peace. Which brings us back to those Israelites asking for water and to us, is God among us or not? Friends, God is among us. For all our political crisis and social unrest, we are offered a vision and a hope. We have opportunities to serve and to love in relationships and family, among strangers and in society. We have a freedom not to settle for what King called an obnoxious peace, but to insist on a better one. Names are important in the Old Testament, and I love that the place where all this happened gets forever remembered with a name that would make the tourist bureau cringe, Meribah and Massa, quarrel and test. They quarreled and tested the Lord there. It's remembered for that because that's when God gave them water. They quarreled and tested, they protested and argued, they complained and insisted on something better, and God gave them the stuff of life. God gave them the stuff that was but a foretaste of when from that rock of injustice and pain, justice would roll down like water, and righteousness from that rock of hurt and longing would come like an ever-flowing stream. Quarreling and testing is met by God, not with anger, but with grace. God moves forward, embraces our complaints or doubts, our questions or stumbles, and sends us to a rock where the outcome is life. Filled with the water, the people could journey on by stages, called upon again and again to feed the hungry, to welcome the stranger, to embrace the immigrant, to share of their wealth, to offer a cup of cool water that they themselves drew from a stone. See, in the face of real pain, real sadness, real struggle, real want. God is among us, maybe more then than at any other time. God may not engage our every debate, but God does meet our deepest need and invites us to show that same love to others. So let us continue our journey, moving past Massa and Meribah, and joining with God on the road to a promised land a land of life for all. May it be so. Amen.
we trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captive. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image to live as one community. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, congregational vitality, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church. And now let us show our gratitude to God with the giving of our tithes and offerings.
They tell you the wonderful things he does And the things that he does, he surely does for you May the people's hearts be filled with praise May the nations be glad and sing for joy May your presence inspire us no matter what we do More majestic than the mountains You've raised the banner high Unfurling it across the bow You're the speaker and the spoken The who, the what, the why The when, the past, the here and now More majestic than the mountains You've raised the banner high Unfurling it across the bow You're the speaker and the spoken The who, the what, the why The when, the past Gracious and holy God, we thank you for all the gifts that you have given to us, and we humbly return a small portion to you for you to bless and multiply it for the use in your kingdom, in this world, in this country, in our community, and in this church. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. First, I would like to offer a, offer a word of thanksgiving to our uh, musicians today. It's Quite wonderful. And the only other announcement I have is a reminder that there is an open house um, at the uh, new shelter that's opened on West 10th Street. And it uh, is named after uh, Dorothy Miller and Nancy Bracken, who are longtime members. And so um, their work has continued on, as does God's work. Now let, let us be a people of prayer. Gracious and holy God, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. But Lord, we find ourselves living in the middle. Sometimes in life's journeys, we wonder, are you there or not? Like the, Israelite, the Israelites, we often feel forsaken and thirst for what is good and life-giving. We humbly ask you, O oh God, to show yourself to us in these difficult times in our world in our country and in our lives. So we bring our request to you, O oh God. We ask that where there is war, there would be peace. 
Where there is hatred, there would be love. Where there is hunger and thirst, there would be abundance. And where there is discord, there would be friendship. Draw near to us, O God, that we may feel your presence as we thirst for righteousness and seek you out in this time and place. Hear our petitions, Lord, and remind us always to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you, our God. And we continue to pray for those listed in our bulletin this morning. We pray that we share the gospel with someone this week. And we pray for Dave Doherty, Sally Hooper, Jane LeMaster, Martha Rapp, Shirley Ryan, Becky Smith, Chris Weninger, Marge Winfield, and Bill Winfield for health needs. We pray for the family and friends who are grieving for our brother in Christ, Norm Steider, and for the family and friends who are grieving for our sister in Christ, Bonnie Germain. We pray for our church here in Michigan City, for Sergeant Brian Leach Hudson, deployed overseas, and we pray for our military and their families. And we pray for the world as we continue to recover and reopen from the COVID-19 pandemic. And also we pray for the world as the pandemic continues. And now let us pray in silence, in the silence of your hearts, that prayer that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we leave this time of worship, let us walk humbly with our God. And now may the love of God, 
and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.